What's going on, y'all? This is Javon.ca. We're here again for another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K, where we're on the hunt to find 100 different ways to make 100 grand in a month. Now, I got someone that I'm really excited to introduce you to. His name is Robert, but we'll call him Rob. And his last name is Onley. He's the founder of a tech company called Notary Pro. Are they tech? Are they legal? You're about to find out. So stay tuned in this episode where we find out a little bit more of his story, how he went from a Scarborough native to focusing on law school, doing a bunch of different entrepreneurial journeys along the way, and now has a global company. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Onley. Awesome. Thanks, Javon. Great to be with you, man. You know, that was a little bit of my intro about you, but I'd love for you to take a moment to kind of introduce yourself to the audience. You know, they've never met you before. For sure. And, uh, you know, they just see your nice hair, your perfectly lined up beard, your super jacked <laughs> muscles, you know, but maybe you could give us a little bit about your own intro, your own story. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, first of all, thanks for having me on the show. Um, great to be with you. And yeah, I mean, I'm just a regular dude from Scarborough that had some amazing parents who challenged me to do great things. I think that's kind of the way I'm starting to look at my life. Uh, I think just for like sort of who I am, I'm a father, first and foremost, father and husband. I got four kids at home. My wife and I are actually expecting our fifth Congrats. in April which by modern standards puts us into kind of like your crazy camp. Um, but we're proud of that. We, we wanted a big family and we're, you know, going to be blessed with a big family. So, that's awesome. um, yeah, but that's me like on the personal side, Yeah. uh, me as a professional. Yeah. I'm a lawyer first and foremost. So I, I went to U of T Scarborough for my undergrad and then I went to Windsor law for law school, um, was fortunate enough to get into law school. I like to say I kind of scraped my way in, uh, on the, uh, third try on the LSAT. Um, and then actually took a couple tries at the bar exams to actually get licensed as a lawyer. So, you know, quick aside, it, it's a lesson in never giving up because I was definitely not one of the kids that like absolutely aced everything all the way through law school or yeah. undergrad. So, um, but yeah, now, as you mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Notary Pro. So we're a national notary public, uh, service. We provide online notary services and that's something I can explain a little bit later, but we help people by simplifying and humanizing legal documents. I think that's the easiest way to, to sum it up. Um, we are the highest rated legal tech company in Canada. Really proud of that. Uh, 13 full-time employees right now, seven part-time and about 300 subcontractors operating in nine provinces. And if you asked me that I'd be running something like this 10 years ago, I would have no clue what you're talking about, um, which I think is also just an example of the journey that life takes you on, right? You have no idea where anything's really going. Yeah. So you just got to buckle in and and enjoy the ride it's crazy i wonder if i wonder where you, where you would actually where were you 10 years ago you know were you just getting into law school i mean you tried the bar exam a couple times the lsats a couple times like yeah why would you even still want to be a lawyer you know yeah good question well i would say so when i was in uh high school my dad noticed the way i wrote and the way i did i guess the way i argued with him and he said you know i think you might be a, a good lawyer was, so was he a lawyer so my dad this is the funny thing my dad was not a lawyer he did one year of law school and then he dropped out okay uh, my grandfather was a lawyer so i do have that kind of lineage or might be you could say it's in the blood to be to practice law mm. um but we weren't one of those families like you know there was some family law firm i was going to inherit it nothing like that yeah um but then yeah when i was in high school i i think i really started to excel in classes where you write and you you're making making arguments. Um, and so I started to think, hey, maybe I could do this law school thing. But that was before undergrad. And then in undergrad, again, I started doing like classes like history and poli sci. Hmm. So I'm a BA. I have a BA in poli sci. I okay. don't have a, an MBA. I never did business really in terms of formal education. Yeah. Um, I like to joke now that I earned my MBA on the street by just like grinding <laughs> and working hard. Right? It's a very so, Scarborough statement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Scarborough kind of always comes through no matter <laughs> what. Uh, I try to keep it G rated with yeah. uh, now that I have kids. But yeah. Yeah. No, but then so 10 years ago, I mm -hmm. was just called to the bar. Okay. Um, so I was a brand new junior lawyer. Yeah. Uh, I was actually working in what they kind of jokingly call a legal sweatshop. So I was doing okay. um, what's called e discovery. So where you're basically tagging documents for thousands and thousands of documents for large scale litigation. So like lawsuits. Okay. Uh, a lot of that is actually done now by AI and automation, which is kind of shows you how rapidly technology has changed even uh, like legal businesses. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, so I'd finished on my uh, articling year. I was working in downtown Toronto. I got this job doing e-discovery and I actually got an opportunity to interview for a job at Global Affairs or Foreign Affairs up in Ottawa. So okay. working for the federal government. And that took me completely out of like traditional law, traditional lawyering. Uh, I worked inside the government in a policy role in mm -hmm. international security. And that was something that just kind of scratched more of my 
like poli sci itch. Yeah. Um, and I did that for about two years. And then I, I got the opportunity to interview for a law or with a law firm based in Ottawa. And so that's kind of where my actual legal career started. Yeah. No, so kind of an uh, uncommon journey. Now that that e discovery phase, that must have felt kind of weird, right? Like you go through all these years of failing the bar, failing the LSATs, and then finally becoming a lawyer. And then they're like, hey, just take these documents. Like, yeah, how did what was kind of what did that feel like? You know, because I, I know like yeah. I went through accounting school and I get this job like processing invoices. I'm like, dude, this is accounting. Like, yeah. Mm, yeah, I don't know if this is for me or not. But what was it like for you? Yeah. And so, I mean, it's, it's a great way of sort of putting it like it was to me a little bit of a slice of humble pie, if you will, because yeah. I had worked at a like a major uh, Bay Street law firm during my articling uh, term. I did not get offered. What does uh, that mean, the art, articling? Is that like yeah. the internship as a lawyer type of thing? Yeah. So articling is that year right after law school. It's mandatory, required by the law society. It's, okay. it's some people call it like a practicum, where you're actually working basically as a junior lawyer. You're just not licensed as a lawyer yet. Yeah. I and think you, med school's got something similar as well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You got to basically show that you can actually do this law thing, and okay. then and you um, did, and now you're processing documents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, well, and the the joke was I, while articling. Or sorry, before Articlean, I wrote the bar exams. Like right when you finish law school, most people go and write the bar exams in June. Mm. And I don't really even know to this day why, but I just failed both. There's two major bar exams, the barrister and the solicitor. Congrats. I failed both. So I uh, I felt like such a loser. I'm not going to lie. I was so ashamed of myself. Almost wow. all, every, all of my buddies, all my friends, they passed. Wow. Um, but then I found out, I start, there's like a little bit of a like a code, right? People start talking like, yo, how'd you do? And it's like, found out some other guys failed, right? Okay. So then there's this little group of failures okay. who got together. We started talking about like what went wrong, why didn't we pass? Mm -hmm. Anyway, while Articlean, I, I had to study. So it, while I'm also trying to grind and do this like Articlean game in downtown Toronto, yeah. with all the people that already passed, I was still studying for the bar exam. Okay. Right? So I actually rewrote the exam a second time and failed it again. Okay. But this time by like a whisker. And that's when I knew I was, I was on to the right path. Okay. Um, long story short, I got a mentor where I was articling and she taught me how to study. So it wasn't oh. about how to write the exam. It was how to study for the exam. And then when I wrote it the third time, I'm not even kidding. It was like, it was like a joke. I knew exactly how to do it. And I, as far as I know, I completely uh, passed with flying colors. So let me ask yeah. how to study, how to learn. It might be an interesting discussion, right? With both mm. of them. And I'm curious, like learning in the real life, because like now to run your business, you got to learn so much, right? All the time. And you're probably at every new stage, you've got new new battles and new bad guys to to crush, right? And you got to learn a new skill set in order yeah. to do so. Um, you know, talk to me about that difference between like learning to study and learning in real life. Yeah. Well, I think there's it's a it's a great sort of framework to consider because when you're just starting out your career, I think mm -hmm. you're more than anything, it's it's the imposter syndrome. You're trying to kind of keep up with everybody. You're trying to keep up appearances. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I thought I was studying the right way. And then I realized after I was taught how to study correctly, how wrong I was. And so wow. the same, I would say, applies once you get into business and you get up in, into the startup world. As you know, like you, you look for me personally, when I look back on where I was even five years ago with this business, I can't believe how little I knew Interesting. and how much more I know now. And to me, it's it's really only iteration. You you learn the stages of your business and where you need, for example, hey, I might need an accountant right now, or hey, I think we need insurance, or mm -hmm. hey, like that regulation actually impacts us. Like mm -hmm. maybe we should stop and mm -hmm. understand that. So you you have to kind of learn the game. That's that's the best way I can put it. Um, and that's that sort of I called it learning on the street. Yeah. Versus the head knowledge you think you have about mm -hmm. business. And and um, I think yeah. that's like a big and a. A big realization for a lot of students coming into the real world, right? Like you learn all this stuff at school and you think like, you're like, oh yeah, I'm in my last year of school. I'm the, yeah. I'm the toughest guy here, right? And then all of a sudden you get in the real world and it's like, yeah, nothing that you actually learned in school is, well, very slim amount, yeah. of, amount of things that you learned in school are actually relevant in most of these cases, right? So that's really cool. So if you were to boil it down, <clears throat> what did that mentor teach you about learning and how have you kind of like applied that? Yeah. Well, the, the first thing uh, I, in that specific context, so this is to pass the bar exams, okay. was to try to recognize that you don't need to know everything, but in the context of that exam, you need to know where to find the answers. And so wow. it was more about learning how to find the answers than trying to remember all the answers. Uh -huh. And when you're talking about bar exams, you're talking about materials like this thick, like no joke, like two inches of 
I think it's like 800 pages of materials and you got to be able to quickly find the answers. Yeah. Because the bar exam is also as much about speed and quickly finding answers as it is about like knowing them. Dude, right? that's life. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. So yeah. once I kind of understood the, the, the framework to look at the exam itself, then I honestly, I went into it that third time to, without sounding too like too much bravado like i knew i was going to do better this time understood because i had that right way of looking at the challenges that's right? really and cool it's similar to business now like i when we run into headwinds we run into issues it's all that practical experience i've learned on the street over the last decade almost of like yeah. okay now we've gone through stuff like this before we know what we're going to do here mm -hmm. um and yeah i mean there's some other sort of anecdotes i can weave in there but yeah that's that's where we're at now cool and then you remember the first time you made 100 grand in a year mm. Yeah, so Notary Pro, we've been around since 2018. Dude, this is, no, I'm talking Rob. Like, oh. it doesn't have to be Notary Pro. I mean, Ooh, tell me about me. Notary Pro. Yeah. But I'm, I want to know about Rob, you know? Like, yeah. this is a, it's, a, it's more about you than it is about the business, They're you know? They're closely, so the, the Notary Pro Rob story is very closely interlinked, I would say, okay. at the outset. So, I mean, like, probably 2017, I feel okay. like, was the first year where um, Notary Pro, as my side hustle then, Yeah. And my legal practice, like together combined, I was making over 100K. Nice. Yeah. Now, when you say legal practice, like you have your own law firm? Like mm -hmm. what? Okay. So walk me through the starting because yeah. you, you only previously got us to the job. You only previously got us to the job point when you were in Ottawa doing all this right. stuff. So, you know, when did this, when did this happen? Yeah. So I was working at Foreign Affairs, really interesting job. And that was one of those like unique life moments. I don't regret it. I did two years there, made a ton of connections crazy experiences this mm -hmm. was like right when uh russia first attacked ukraine in 2014 they crazy. took over crimea so i went through all that um then i got the opportunity to interview with a new law firm that was was basically just opening in ottawa and i i just i talked to my dad about it at the time and he's like you gotta go you gotta take the experience yeah right and so i went and i i joined this law firm and i was their only associate and it was honestly it was an awesome experience that yeah it's been crazy it was, I think, four partners and then one associate and a couple sort of supporting staff. So I was like the guy doing all the grunt work, grind work, go for work. And honestly, nothing but positive uh, experiences when I look back on that. Mm -hmm. That's where I started out my, I would say, my formal legal practice. That's when like Robert Onley, you know, Law Society of Ontario sort of became activated. Yeah. Um, well, you finally passed the test, right? So <laughs> yeah, that's it. yeah, and it took a few tries. Right? Yeah, yeah. But then the, um, the reality was while there, mm -hmm. someone knocked on the door. And I remember this. And this is a quick story of, of Notary Pro. Someone knocked on the door, a fellow in his 80s. And he wow. said, you know, do you provide notary services? And I said, well, sure, I can help you with that. And I realized mm -hmm. really quickly he had no idea really what he was doing, no idea what it was supposed to cost, mm -hmm. really what the sort of end product was for him or like what, what did he get out of it? Yeah. Um, and he also didn't even really know where to go to get something notarized. Huh. And so that's kind of the nexus moment, if you will, of when Notary Pro was, uh, the, the original idea was created. Yeah. Now, were you at this point where you were feeling something in your job that you're like entrepreneurship is calling me like where did that itch and why did you even think you could do this you know yeah well i would say i've always kind of had a little entrepreneurial streak so okay. i've always been i've always kind of gravitated to leadership roles and kind of you know creating things okay super quick side hustle story was when i was in undergrad uh, after my third year i started a little side business installing led lights in cars if you remember way back when before like audi put uh, under the cars no or no you know like audi put the little leds inside their headlights this is like 15 years ago I yeah like, Ooh, that's cool well i basically put those in people's like civics and oh wow and stuff because okay again, scarborough right so <laughs> uh so i had i had uh this random side business called custom eyes and i had an ad up on kijiji okay and i had dudes mostly guys calling saying hey i want to put these lights in my civic or my accord or whatever yeah and so i was doing that on my driveway in scarborough at my parents place that that got me started on the entrepreneurial thing so oh, wow. flash forward i i had run and started up a, a non-profit which is now called the young diplomats of canada no way and that kind of got me into the global affairs is thing. it still running still or? running today yeah i think it's youngdiplomats.ca great great organization what's your current uh affiliation and involvement with that are you like just an alum like, yeah I, I, I would be sort of the ex uh, or the, the the former founder and yeah. past executive director and that's going back now almost 10 years but wow that so that's kind of another example of that entrepreneurial side mm -hmm. um and then when i was working in the law firm i would say no i, I didn't 
start working there with any mindset of I'm going to start another side hustle. Yeah, I would say it kind of landed in my lap and I realized there's a there's a gap in the market for notary services. No one was really trying to a- attack the notary public services market with any sort of intentionality. Yeah. Um, now, when I started it, I'm talking a Kijiji ad, and I always say Kijiji, like I, that's, that's before, your backbone, eh? Kind of before Facebook Marketplace yeah. really took off. We're talking like 2015, I guess, mm-hmm. 2016. Um, yeah, and I, I started. Pe- uh, people started calling me. And so that's what I, that's where I started. For those that don't know, myself included, like what's the difference between a notary and a, a lawyer? Like, what does a notary actually do? Yeah, yeah. So a notary in Ontario is uh, an official appointed by the government. Mm-hmm. to take check identities and witness signatures on official documents okay in ontario they are uh, primarily either lawyers or paralegals so it's a it's like a type of lawyer or paralegal okay um in other provinces there are standalone notaries so you can be a notary and not a lawyer or paralegal but it's really just like a designation and appointment that you get from the government to say this person can check your id and witness your signature and then they sign so if i'm the notary i sign and then i seal i'm doing this because we actually emboss the paper that's like and the wax and the stamp like yeah, this game of thrones we don't do the wax anymore but we emboss okay. so we like kind of puncture the paper got it and it has a you know a ring that shows my name my province and and basically identifies me as a notary so wow and that what that does is that says like let's say you and i were going to do a contract today we sign the contract mm-hmm. and there's a notary and they sign and stamp it what that's saying is like you your id was checked my id was checked we were who we say we were on that date on that time okay. you can trust the authenticity of the signatures on this document wow and that that by the way dates back to the roman empire which is one of those little random factoids that um it kind of underpins what a notary is mm-hmm. even though the the average consumer doesn't really know what a notary is until they need one Wow. And that's where we, we kind of swoop in. And like, when do people need notaries? Is it just for contracts? Is it, is it like, like in what situation would someone need a notary? Yeah. So the most, the, the way we put it is you need a notary at life's most important moments and stages. So okay. you can kind of think of it in like really simple buckets, births, education, marriage, real estate, career, uh, retirement, and then death. And okay. then, so at each of those junctures, there's typically a document or documents that you may not not must but may need to get notarized okay the for example the most common one that people think about is wills and powers of attorney so a last will and testament you know you write out your wishes those don't actually need to be notarized but a lot of people choose to get them notarized because it it authenticates it validates the signature yeah on the document interesting um then real quick example most people can relate to is real estate so when you buy a house you don't realize it, but you on a, on about between four to six, sometimes seven, eight uh, documents within your closing package. You're actually getting a lot of those documents notarized or commissioned. It's the other term you might hear. Okay. Um, and usually you do that with your lawyer who is appointed as a commissioner or, or a notary. So mm-hmm. there's documents that you're basically, when you sign them, you're swearing that they're true. And mm-hmm. that's really what you're doing when you get a document notarized. You're saying, I swear I'm who I say I am on this document. Mm-hmm. The contents of the document are true. And I'm actually swearing this under oath in mm. front of an official, mm. a notary who's appointed to take oaths and to to commission the document. So how does one emboss a document digitally? Because that that might have been that like I I I know there's a lot of arguments from people in a previous generation that say, oh, this thing's been done in person. You can't do this online, which is probably something that you heard often, right? Like, what is how does that work? And what were some of those early rejections that you were getting? Yeah, awesome question. And I would say this is kind of the like the origin story of the modern Notary Pro platform as okay. it is today. So and what? No, no, no. Yeah. Okay, so let's not get into it then. What was the origin of Notary Pro? So yeah, so you're working as a lawyer and you see that you see the gap in the marketplace. Then what happens? Yeah, yeah, you're right. So if we back up. So this is like 2016. I put an ad online. People start calling. Kijiji, OG. Kijiji. You still got Kijiji, you still got Kijiji ads up or what? We we still do. Yes, we do. Yeah, because it's awesome. a, it's a lead gen source, right? Yeah, People yeah. look for Kijiji for random stuff. So, okay. but no. So I'm I'm practicing law. I put an ad up. I put my phone number, and my phone starts to ring, and I start getting texts. And I realize like really quickly, I'm like, this is not going to work. So I I my wife at the time, an amazing woman, was like, we'll put my phone number. So my wife Natasha starts taking calls and texts from random people looking for notary services. And this is because you're a full-time lawyer at this I'm, point. I'm working full-time and I'm doing my absolute best to honor the fact that like I'm expected to do full-time work for them. Mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and so people start um, wanting to book appointments. And I realized really quickly, this ain't going to work. Like I need a system. Yeah. So I, this is again, kind of part of my wiring. I went and made a really simple website. I actually got lucky. I bought the domain notarypublicottawa.com. 
Apply. Nobody had it. Wow. And so I really quickly learned SEO, okay. H1 titles, H2 keywords, all that good stuff. Okay. But I also found a scheduling um, app that was really affordable and I fa figured out how to embed it in my website. And so I basically created this really dead simple website that was like, if you need a notary in Ottawa, just book an appointment. And it was like a, maybe like a five click thing. Like, yes, today, yes, at four o'clock, here's my information, book. book yeah. They get an email, I get an email, I know what document they need. They also agree to the pricing. So I just made it really easy mm -hmm. to book an appointment. And I would say that's kind of been the underlying ethos that then became Notary Pro, the more, let's say, official brand, which is what it is today. So, yeah. So when did yeah. it, how did it start changing from Notary Public Ottawa to Notary Pro? Like when did that all happen? Yeah. So so I, I kind of kicked this thing off by accident early mm -hmm. 2016. By like 2017, I was meeting like five, six, seven, eight people a night at my house wow. in the suburbs in Ottawa. I was meeting them on the weekends. I was getting phone calls Sunday mornings. Like yeah. it was like, it was becoming disruptive. And how long does it take to notarize something? Like a couple minutes. As long as it takes to sign it. Really. It's a couple. Yeah. It's a, it's a quick process. And that's also the beauty of it. And yeah. I started to package that in the, in the basic messaging, like most appointments completed in under five minutes, you know, and crazy. So it's the value proposition. So, yeah. um, but what I figured out more than anything was SEO in Ottawa. So I figured out how to rank number one mm. in Ottawa and that, so there's like, there's an underlying web story that some people might geek out on. Dive in. Like rank, you know, <laughs> basically like how to rank first for your top keywords. Okay, give me a crash course. And so, well, so the first thing is having a business name that also aligns with what people are searching for. So okay. having a brand like Notary Public and then the word Ottawa meant that when people literally typed Notary, Notary Public, Public Ottawa <laughs> for top ranking result, right? Uh -huh. Then I figured out I needed to have more localized pages. So I set up, um, uh, let's say like suburban specific pages. So in Ottawa, it was like Notary Public Barhaven, Notary Public Nepean, Notary Public Canada. So I started to basically mess around and, and I, I wouldn't say game it, but like set up landing pages that catch people no matter where they were in and, Ottawa. And where were you learning this? Because I remember a couple of years back, you picked up the skill from your mentor. Yeah. Uh, where to learn and how to learn and how to find the answers. This was all just like learning on, you, on my own through you, YouTube. YouTube primarily. University. Yeah. Right? YouTube University. No way. We went to the yeah. same school. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Like a lot of people now. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> but this was, I, it, it almost feels like a different era because there was, there was good stuff on YouTube in 2017. Don't uh -huh. get me wrong. But like, it wasn't so systematized as the way it is now where you see like those perfectly curated little video snippets with the catchy titles and like they're, they're almost like clickbait videos nowadays. Yeah. But I mean, so once I figured out how to drive traffic and I started to monitor it, I realized what I really needed to do was get other people to work for me. And like, I guess, long story short there, I, through happenstance, I came across a really good contract template that was called a referral services agreement. Wow. And I figured out that you could basically subcontract the, the process of notarizing documents to somebody else and then set up a com commission structure that is favorable for them and favorable for the business. And so wow. that's when we realized we could set up a way to refer uh, clients mm -hmm. to other notaries. And that's when I, I would say I had the light bulb moment of like, wait a sec, this isn't just a side hustle. This is a legit business model. Yeah. Um, and so real quick, I went from my location in Nepean in the West end of Ottawa to like, I think it was Nepean, downtown Ottawa, and then Barhaven. So we had three locations for like half a year. And you had like just a subcontractor in each spot that yeah. you kind of relied on. Yeah. And I would go and I, would, I remember meeting for coffee with people. I think I went to lunch with like, it was very formalized. I was very nervous and cautious, like yeah. who I first hired. And yeah. Uh, and then, you know, from there, it quickly went from like three to, I think it was like 12 in Ottawa proper. Wow. And then I just started getting notaries from across Canada applying. And I was like, wait a sec. I can't be branded Notary Public Ottawa. I need something like more broad. Global, yeah. Right. So um, Notary Pro, I don't really remember the exact sort of nexus of it, but mm -hmm. the key thing was the on the keyword search, if you start typing N-O-T-A-R-Y, what Google now suggests is not only Notary Public, but Notary Pro, because the next letter is the P. Wow. Right. So it was very much a, a very calculated branding decision and mm -hmm. a very calculated switch to the to a more, let's say, nationally uh, uh, appealing brand. Right. So. Wow. That's where like, you know, you hear of some people, they tell their, their entrepreneur story, like some things seem like accidents. I would say mine was like a calculated series of accidents. accidents right? <laughs> yeah. Like, one accident after another, just one bad decision after yeah, another. Yeah. 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 Scarborough, man. <laughs> and, and then like, you know, little things like now the, the, the color scheme, like the white and the red, like yeah. that's not accidental. That's Canada. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so, uh, and cause I've had conversations with other, other founders and I say like, go on my website, you want to talk about entrepreneurship, go on my website, mm -hmm. literally every single pixel has been 
poured over and sweated over. Like nothing is just by chance. Wow. Button placement, size, spacing, font mm-hmm. size. What's the first ranking thing, not the second? Like wow. it's calculated, right? So because you have to nowadays. Yeah. You can't really afford to have a crappy website that that it doesn't rank well so yeah and 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 i guess when did you i guess that was probably the the moment that you started realizing the importance of seo Mm -hmm. wow Mm -hmm. so yesterday i was i was shadowing um and as i was telling you briefly before we got started i was shadowing um an entrepreneur Mm -hmm. and what they sell as seo services so like throughout the day i'm just getting like mini crash courses on seo now now it's coming up again yeah and it's it's slowly starting to realize the importance of it and it's it's literally like your digital storefront right it and is. yeah and how well you rank is literally your foot traffic in front of your store that's crazy well and and exactly and then so as just to pick up on that and kind of carry the the history yeah we so i rebranded as notary pro mm-hmm. i want to say in late 2018 okay um we i also incorporated uh federally so i i, I started to get advice from other professionals and i think yeah. that's the other kind of comment i'd make for anyone Okay. It's in there, depending on where you are in your journey. Yeah. You got to surround yourself with a team of people that are smarter than you mm-hmm. at the things that you're not never going to be an expert on. Yeah. Right. And that's something I say that openly, freely, like we have an amazing accounting and bookkeeping team that helps us. I do not ever want to become an accountant or a bookkeeper. So I'm mm-hmm. going to hire and outsource stuff that I'm never going to be good at. Right? Yeah. And that's yeah. something I started to do more and more. Um, and then life took me some, into some cool paths. So I met um, who, who is now my co-founder, my chief marketing officer, David. Okay. Um, through my family. He's actually married to my cousin, but we had like a random meeting at a Christmas thing. We started talking and like yeah. flash forward five years later and he's my co-founder had been with us for five years. He he was our first full-time employee and like wow. he's a whiz at marketing. Yeah. Right. And and web design and all that stuff. So you got to pull people in. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of founders bootstrap. Mm-hmm. They try to bootstrap everything, but mm-hmm. I think there's a really key moment where you got to realize you got to let some stuff go and outsource or hire and when do you think that decision is if you were to because like you're calculated you're mm-hmm. paying attention to every little detail and like your business is pr- predominantly web well not predominantly it is web it is yeah right yeah. like you're an e-commerce like yep. let's be real yeah uh, e-commerce type of service which i think is really cool mm-hmm. um but and you've and in order to do that you you have systems in place left right and center like the whole thing is just a series of systems yep. not the one big system uh what point in your system, does it trigger in your mind, I need to add this new person? Yeah, I think it's when you as a founder, especially if you're doing like founder led sales and you can get into all that stuff, but like when mm-hmm. you get to the point where you realize, man, I am not good at this or this is taking way too long and now I can't do the other stuff I am good at. Huh. That's when I I made the call, especially on the marketing side, on the website mm. um, and then on the tech side to just bring other people in. And in the same case, uh, for example, when I met my other co-founder, uh, Charlie, who is on the tech side, I, I think we met at like a wedding party or something. We were neighbors Random. and we, oh, hey, how's it going? You live nearby, you know, that type of thing. Yeah. And then I started telling him about how I wish I had this like bot that could just answer questions for clients that ask the same thing. Because in our business, we get probably the same 10 questions every day, like hundreds of times, right? Yeah. And he's like, oh, well, like I build those. And so then we started chatting and then I realized I'm like, you should work with me. Like, let's work together. You yeah. Know? And yeah. kind of the rest is history. So wow. once you get to that point where you just know, like, I'm never going to figure this out. Like I, my joke is I'm not, I'm not a coder either. Like, but mm. I love to mess around on the back end of WordPress. Yeah. Uh, until my team took away my access. So that I didn't break <laughs> anything anymore. But yeah. 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 That's it's a cool. key moment. So that's interesting. So what, um, what key moments are you feeling right now? Cause at, at, at all times, right? Like you could feel growth pains, mm-hmm. you know, and I know you, you guys have, are are breaking records you know every couple months at this point yeah right what what kind of where are you feeling your shirt getting a little tight right now yeah so i mean it's a great great question i think the biggest area um for us that we and we had to do a whole sprint on this and i'll, I'll touch on a couple of things a but sprint okay keep, yeah, yeah, keep yeah, going yeah. keep going i, I can talk questions. to devlin go yeah yeah, yeah let's nerd out man. yeah yeah okay. <laughs> let's do but it. we um you know we we hit a point where our web traffic was getting higher than ever our okay. um, you know unique visitors all that good stuff and we had to take a serious look at basically our backend infrastructure and our architecture. And we had to say, is this set up? So like our databases, the way it's all coded, is this sustainable if we like two or three X volume in the next six to, to, to 12 months, right? Wow. And so um, based on our my, my chief technology officer, Julian, the recommendation was, no, it's not. Mm. We need to do like a serious sort of look back restructure. And, a, and a restructure and sort of what we call the stabilization sprint. And so that was wow. in the last six months 
where we had to kind of pause all the call it creative development okay and just focus on making sure the everything that underpins it is stable and ready for more scale um and th so that's probably where you know you asked kind of like what what were the moments more recently like mm -hmm. that was a big one yeah was when i realized like we can't keep our web host where it has been for the last five years, that's not going to work. Yeah. We can't keep our sort of our cyber infrastructure the same way because mm. we're not going to withstand a more serious uh, attack, like cyber yeah. attack. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then especially once we got more national, we're in all these different provinces, mm -hmm. you know, you, you do start to wonder about things like, okay, where am I exposed on cybersecurity, on insurance, on de like denial of service attacks? And, and then even things like where the login button is on your website, you start to kind of look at things a little differently when you yeah. realize that your business could be taken out by a cyber attack, right? So, wow. yeah, that's probably the biggest uh, moment in recent year where we're like, wait a sec, we got to treat this quite a bit more seriously. So what are, you, you mentioned you did this sprint, which I think is super cool. Mm -hmm. um, at what point in, in your mind does it trigger, uh, we should probably set up a sprint right now. And how do you decide what the leading, like where do you start with the sprint? Do you just say, this is my overarching question, let's brainstorm? Yeah. Yeah, so we have, I mean, at this stage, so I mean, I'll talk about like, call it Notary Pro 2024 or 2025, like, because we're already talking about yeah. what we're doing for the next like, yeah, yeah, yeah. five, six, seven quarters. But um, five, you, hold on, hold on. Yeah. Sorry, you just said you're, you're planning the next five, six, seven quarters. So the next 18 months out, really. Yeah, like we have, so wow. we have 2024 all fully mapped out. Okay. Uh, I would say there's a couple sprints or like epics that are mapped for 2025 that they may bleed into 24, but. I, what typically happens is one or two of the major sprints will bleed actually into the next year, right? So okay. one thing we've been trying to do is actually um, more on the capacity planning for the developers. So try to give them a little bit extra buffer zone mm -hmm. in each sprint mm -hmm. to account for unplanned huh. requests or tickets that come up that are feature requests or patches, hot fixes, all that stuff. Mm. So we're trying now to basically build in some sort of surge capacity or, or, or flex capacity is a, is a better word. Okay. Within each quarter sprint to uh, tackle things that come up wow. um, that we didn't expect. What um, were, what, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, I know. And mm -hmm. I mean, so that's, that's become foundational and uh, probably my, my team watching this after will laugh, but like I'm the worst culprit for throwing out a new idea to the developers and then one of them just grabbing it and loving it or whatever and running with it. Yeah. And before we know it, it's already getting pushed into production <laughs> when really it was just an idea. And so we had to put um, some guardrails on me. Yeah, and you're I'm, the bottleneck. Yeah. You're the problem. I'm the problem half the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. but that it's really good to have um, a team that at least can, you know, acknowledge like some new ideas. It's not always from me, right? And mm -hmm. oftentimes it's from our frontline team that's providing the online notary services. Mm. they're saying hey like what if the button did this instead of this mm -hmm. and then automatically did this other thing and we're like oh well like duh why did how did we why? not think of that yeah over the last five years you what know, other so. what other kind of ideas have you implemented from the suggestions of team members and now like since you're a systems guy mm -hmm. what systems do you have in place to listen to the front end right yeah. what what systems do you have because like what you're 12 people now you're hundreds at this point of subcontractors notaries, yeah. notaries yeah. right around the country and it, i i don't know i'm getting a gut feeling that you're trying to go global pretty soon mm -hmm. you know but what what mechanisms and systems do you have in place that enables your team to listen from the ground up yep um from the front lines so one of the i guess the, the foundational components of how we, we operate and i think yeah. part of our success is we use slack for internal communication Okay. We have a dedicated channel that's just for feedback, and that is huh. also for idea suggestions. So wow. the team knows that that's where you can throw feedback at any time. Okay. It doesn't mean it's going to be translated into a ticket and then added into a sprint or even necessarily added to the backlog of tickets, but yeah. they have a channel to just throw it in there. We also built a function right within our own app that is to report a bug or, or suggest a feature. So cool. right from where you are in the app, you can just right click and say um, bug or feedback. Yeah. And we, but it, I would say it's taken time. I won't overstate it. It's yeah. taken time to get people comfortable to just like make suggestions. Right. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I've always said, if you can, you know, for example, reduce four clicks to one, that's, that's a like green light almost every day, every day. feedback uh, or, t or ticket. Yeah. Right. Cause like why make someone click four times, 50 times a day when you can make click 50 times, you know what I mean? So understood. Um, but yeah, we're, we're always, uh, and we, we now have a more, I would say robust, um, product road mapping sort of review process. Okay. But we're, we're pretty lean. We're pretty, I'd say lean and mean, like I'm the product owner for the most part. Yeah. Oh yeah. And then we have our dev team and our engineers that, that work, um, you know, on all the tickets and sprints. So 
Mm -hmm. We're still a lean organization in that sense. Yeah. But as we continue to grow and scale, I think we're going to grow on the dev side. Yeah. For sure. you, you're no longer a baby anymore. You know, now you're starting to get kicked out of the startup events because you're not a startup anymore. That's it. Like I was saying before we started, <laughs> yeah. we, we applied to a recent uh, like an angel program and they were like, no, you're, you're too late stage for this. So, yeah. yeah. Big um, boy. It's a little bit go, of a go pick on somebody your own size. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I wrote back like, you know, we're not looking for any special treatment, but like, yeah. thanks for considering us. Yeah. But that's also, I think, a validation of kind of the growth, right? Wow. The trajectory when you are told like, look, you don't really qualify as a startup, but um, we still, I, I say we still act like one. Like we, we entertain ideas, we mm -hmm. throw stuff at the wall. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had our, our uh, second annual corporate retreat in Ottawa nice. in November. We had everybody together. We did a bunch of brainstorming, cool pressure testing our own um, call it in, initial plans ah. uh, to see what makes sense and which order these sprints should go. And, cool. and that kind of thing. Now, yeah. what were some, because you, you, re, you recall the story so eloquently. Um, I'm curious what some of the previous sprints were that led to um, some spikes in growth, right? Like, yeah. so what were some sprints that you've had in the past? And what were some of the questions that you asked of yourself and as a team in, in some chapters that have passed before? Well, so the biggest one, and I think I was, I was about to get into this was, so we, we got to talk about the pandemic, right? So okay. we are a national network of notaries. I'm, and now I'm flashing back to 2018, 2019. We're probably okay. like, 50 locations across Canada. These and, are, and when you say locations, you mean yeah. cities? Yeah, cities. So like notaries operating in okay. their city or town or their community okay. under the Notary Pro banner. And mm -hmm. we're sending them clients. We're providing all the administrative services, answering calls, emails, cancellations, refunds, all that good stuff Yeah, for them, right? Okay. The pandemic starts to hit. You know, it was like that January-ish of 2020. Everyone was like, whoa, this might actually be a thing moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so internally, we started talking about trying like an online notary type of idea. Mm. The pandemic hits and we as a team, we just said, screw it. We're going to go for it. So we quickly connected some of our APIs. So our scheduling API with our website, with Zoom and then an e-signing tool. And we just put it on the web and we called it online notary. Right. Now, this had existed in the U.S. There's a couple of companies that were doing it down there. OK. Did not exist in Canada. And so within three days of the first lockdown, we had Canada's first online notary on our website. And this was wow. like total duct tape, super glue, yeah. like bubble gum, like holding it all together, right? It was not a fully built anything, Yeah. but we had it online. And in our first day, we had our first client. And that's that was like a light bulb moment. We're like, wait a sec. We got something. People are going to want to do this yeah. because they're forced to stay home, right? Yeah. And pretty obvious now in hindsight, but... At the time when everyone's like still watching the news and still kind of in that freak out oh, phase, yeah, we were like doing hey, keep let's... ups with toilet paper and push up. Yeah, oh yeah, and I remember going to the the grocery store and there was no rice <laughs> and being like, what? You yeah, know? So, yeah. But yeah. no, but seriously, we we realized that this is a moment for the company. This is like mm -hmm. the pivot. Okay, you know, and so we happen to be the first in Canada to launch the online notary service, which, if you don't know, basically means you can jump on a video call with a notary public, a licensed legal professional on your browser mm -hmm. and get your document digitally signed within we say seven minutes of hitting our website huh. uh, and that was an industry first wow. but then so from that moment forward just to come back to your question once we launched the online notary we and it started to take off we realized well look we got to build like a proper platform here we can't just wow. kind of have this like duct bunch tape. of duct tape holding it together because yeah. it wasn't going to work so that was our yeah. first major sprint and then we launched the first real proper Canadian online notary app, I think it was July of 2020. No, how much, how much revenue were you guys doing when like the pandemic hit? Yeah. And when, when you realized, okay, the duct tape's not going to hold it anymore. I think we were uh, ballpark. Me, like maybe we were hitting around like 10 K a month oh, wow. of digital. So we call it digital revenue. Okay. And we were like, wait a sec. Cause before you were still doing the in-person, I mean, it's kind of like a still, it probably still is active, but like it was yeah. just in-person stuff before, right? It was, it was all in-person. And so we had a take mm -hmm. rate of about 40% on every dollar that we were pulling in through the in-person network, okay. which is great, but you basically just need more, more um, workers, flow. more notaries, more deal flow. Yeah, to keep it's a that. volume, labor, whereas, linear relationship at that time. Exactly. Whereas the, on the digital revenue side, especially once we staffed the labor in-house okay. the, the margin was a lot higher right? it was a little wow. more in that like upper 80s 90 percent kind of range so wow. oh we were because, able to staff it because like you only need the the other notaries if it's location-based but the moment that you're online only yeah. they could be in-house just working in -house. on zoom all day and yeah. 
And now your model changes from a, a percentage split to an hourly plus the carry cost or the operating cost. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. So exactly. And so the model yeah. shifted fundamentally, right? Wow. And we, we went through some major growing pains there. We yeah. had basically, we had uh, lawyers and paralegals and it was, mm -hmm. it was kind of this hodgepodge and they were all subcontractors. Yeah. Um, and then actually the law society, I would say sort of, and the ministry of uh, the attorney general did us a favor in the sense okay. that they then opened up the pool of notaries to include paralegals. And so we could have people other than lawyers who could also be notaries. Yeah, now your cost of labor just went down. Cost of labor went down. Yeah. We also had a lot of people who were really hungry for some sort of- Digital work, right? Digital work yeah. during the pandemic. So yeah. we were one of those, I, I always say we were a pandemic baby. Like yeah. all the prevailing forces kind of actually were were like wind behind ourselves. I mean, dude, you could call it that, but I think at the same time, like you already had your surfboard in the water ready for the wave. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like at the end of the day, there's people on the beach saying, hmm, I should probably surf. And you're like, yeah, fuck it, I'm surfing. I'm surfing. You know? yeah, 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 exactly. Calabunga, dude. And we, and well, we did, and we just kind of went for it, right? Yeah. And that's where it's like, you know, to the earlier question about sort of the difference between studying and learning on the ground. Like, yeah. But at that point, we were more in that learning on the ground. We were just rolling and we were trying things, testing mm -hmm. things. I remember distinctly changing our landing page to put online notary above, above. person notary, and it was like, ooh, it might upset everybody. And but it was like people no. probably didn't even notice dude. well and also it's the pandemic like yeah. people expected online everything yeah right? and so we positioned it that way we the, the the selling features of the value proposition was like do it from home yeah do it securely don't get sick mm -hmm. right and not not to we didn't like take advantage of the yeah pandemic. like haha do online it's it like here, it's a, available <laughs> like literally a description of like you will you're less likely to be exposed yeah by staying home so. now where's like the recurring element so how does what's like the life cycle i know you mentioned what was it seven to ten points uh during like a person's life that they're gonna need a notary is there is there any type of clients or you know customers that you have that come back on a more frequent basis yeah, for sure. So I mean the the on the for the average consumer, so we, yeah. we pretty much segment B to C and B to B. And then okay. we sort of have B to B to C, which I can get into if you want. But on the B to C side, the average consumer, yeah, the, we we figure there's about seven touch points that are almost guaranteed. Okay. Um for some people, those let's say five to seven times they need a notary, they all happen kind of later in life. Yeah. Um there's also a big demographic piece to this, which is new new Canadians or permanent residents or immigrants to Canada that tend to, to need notary services more often and more frequently upon first landing in the country. Got it. So they're typically going through the PR process. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get their first job. Mm -hmm. They're notarizing copies of their identity. They have to prove who they were. Yeah. Or in some cases, they have to apply to get names changed. There's a lot of stuff that, um, and it's a whole other piece we can talk about, but like yeah. the, the system, the immigration system, imposes on people who are new to Canada. We can talk about whether that's good or bad, but like primarily they need notaries more than the average consumer does, like yeah, the average yeah. Canadian or let's say landed Canadian. Yeah. Now on the recurring side, uh, it's primarily on the B2B side. So okay. um, there's a few key industries that need notary services consistently. It's construction, real estate, uh, estates and then a lot of stuff in kind of the engineering and sort of environmental Something space that needs like a real sign off yeah and so there's like there's application forms where companies have to swear the authenticity or let's say the accuracy of their reports yeah. or their submissions like an environmental study or something exactly. along those lines yeah yeah the biggest one that we were sort of it sort of let's say pleasantly surprised us was um on the construction side wow there's a couple of uh, provincial laws at least in ontario that uh -huh. require uh, statutory declarations that's where you're the company is basically swearing the truth of what they're submitting yeah to another company yeah and that's to do with um, the supply of goods on major construction sites so huh. we we started to discover all these little like niches of niches of niches yeah and we realized like man people need us need right? it dude yeah um so we talk about like sprint inflection points we uh -huh. built a portal for our b2b clients to let them sign in quickly book an appointment view their past appointments download their past documents like really Cool. Really basic so, functionality. So now like, you guys are like a storage for like recurring clients, like whenever they got to come back, like, and I guess that's yeah. part of the real, the real brainstorm around infrastructure and security where it's like, oh, we got to keep this stuff secure for these clients, right? Yep. That's no, exactly. Cool, and like, the, so a quick example of that and kind of pulling together a couple of these questions, we realized like our corporate clients, one yeah. thing they were looking for was social sign on. Like, I don't want to remember my notary pro password. I just want to yeah. use my Gmail. Let me into your app. So we okay. added that, right? And then a couple of people were like, hey, like, 
I want two-factor authentication on this account because these are like confidential business documents. We're like, hey, no problem. So we add 2FA, right? Uh -huh. Like little things like that, that mm -hmm. I think because of a lot of us were, I would say we're spoiled by Google and Facebook yeah. and now ChatGPT. Like we're spoiled by the big dog platforms. Like everything seems like, of course they have that. Of course they have. Yeah. But when you're an entrepreneur and you're a smaller company, you're like, let's add two-factor authentication. And I go to my CTO, I'm like, how do we do that? that? How do like, we do that? It'll take a week. Right. Like, oh, oh, okay. Only a week. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but when yeah. you're small, that's like Dude, your entire huge. dev team stops to do that basic functionality. Yeah, so, yeah. And that, now we're getting into credentialing and it's basically like if you sign in from one door, it lets you through the other doors wow. on the Micro uh, platform. Just all that stuff that, again, everybody takes for granted because frankly, Gmail, uh, as an example, they it's, babied us, man. It's so well built. It's so robust. They've made it almost completely bug free. Yeah. Right. But when you're building it yourself, trust me, there's bugs. Dude, I've been so. trying to build a website for how long? You know, the thing doesn't even look good on mobile. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> dang. I'm like, the bug. You gotta hire. Like, you gotta hire a mobile uh, web designer. That's yeah, my dude. That's I, my I mean, hey, bro, my shirt's getting tight. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that's part of the reason why I ask is like, hey, how do you know like when's the right time for this? Yeah. Now, you, yeah. you remember the first time mm -hmm. you made a uh, hundred in a month? Yeah, so I looked this up. So it was June of 21. Okay. And what was interesting there was, I don't, I don't remember exactly, Yeah. but the we had a huge jump. So I think the month prior we made like 75. And okay. And then it went to like 106. Nice. And there was, yeah, there was a document that came out um, around that time. And I forget exactly the scenario, but it had mm -hmm. to do with uh, the the COVID lockdown, so the border uh, issues. Oh, wow. And so the IRCC, Federal Immigration Department, mm -hmm. put out a new form to allow people to apply to bring their family members across the border. Huh. And so we just went from like, you know, trucking along, everything was growing kind of like a couple percent a month, five, six percent a month to like, oh, let's do like a 30 percent month over month increase. And it wow. was because of this one document. Wow. And so that that's where like the notary business people ask me like, what is a notary? They kind of, it's almost like a joke. Like, I don't know what it is. And I'm like, I know you don't. Yeah, we do. We're capturing <laughs> yeah. almost 40, 45 percent of all web traffic in Canada. Wow. Like, when you need one, you should find us. Right. Yeah. And that's where when these new forms come out, we have playbooks now. So like a new form comes out from the government that has to be notarized. We mm. have a page online. We have a YouTube video. We have a guide. Yeah. We put it in our help center. We put it in our chat bot. So your SEO is going like, crazy. Boom. And so exactly. So even most recently in November, um, you mentioned we had our, our record month. Mm hmm. There was a new IRCC form that came out to allow people to sponsor family members in Haiti, Colombia, and Venezuela. Wow. We had a YouTube video online within nine hours that outranked the federal government's landing page for that same form. Wow. Right? So I don't know how that works, but we had a little more domain authority. Yeah. Yeah. At, than the initially, government. Right. And then it, it yeah. sorted itself out. The, yeah. the IRCC website went back number one. <laughs> that's that's okay. like, that's You're probably example. number two, though. Well, I think yeah. we still are, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and then we had people in our intake form. We asked them, how did you find us? Okay. And like a bunch of people are like, YouTube, 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 YouTube. Wow. Right? So it just shows the power of, of the SEO. Video. Power of SEO, power of video. The power of video, exactly. Yeah. And the importance of being like front of, front of line. And by that, I mean like when stuff hits, you got to be out there. You got to be boom, pouncing, yeah. socials. So you think- it's, it's tiring though. So how does, how is like the, that relationship with updates and timeliness? You know, like it would as it pertains to SEO. So mm -hmm. I just my ears got perked up yesterday to SEO. It's kind of been like happening over the course of months. I got a friend, you know, um, he's got a pretty cool SEO business. He ranks number one for Toronto SEO services. Nice. These new guys rank number one in their respective field. Um, you know, I'll give them a shout out as well. Influencer marketing, whatever city, they're gonna pop up as number one, the first non sponsored ad. Nice. Um, you know, it, shout out you. You type in notary services in Canada, you're gonna be the first one. Notary Pro, up. hopefully. Yeah. I, and I was looking, and I, I'm like, okay, let me not click the Google ad and cost them a bunch of money. Yeah. So Thank if you, you search it, don't click the Google ad. Just click the non-sponsored. You're one. welcome, David. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, how is the relationship between timeliness and SEO rankings on a topic? Right. Like, how yeah. do those? How does when you hear about updates? What's your thought? Because you're at this point where you know directly the boost in rankings is going to impact your bottom line like immediately yes. right like you saw a 20 percent, 30 percent jump yeah automatically the moment that the government you know in introduce something Put out that form yeah right it's like oh the government just made a new street like this is going to be a new search topic like how do we get number one like how hungry are you on that what's that competition feel like you know it must feel like sports it it, it does yeah and i would say the it's it's sort of like you, you can kind of geek out on it because yeah. You want to win the race, 
Okay. But also it's a, I would say there's, there's the race, but then there's the long game. So it's the quality of the content, right? So you can't huh. just put out, you know, those, like, if you look for a recipe for something now that unfortunately Google, I, in my opinion, has been kind of gamed by these garbage articles that you like, you look for an apple pie recipe and it's like, the thing about apple pie is that it starts with, you know, and you're like, just give me the recipe. So yeah. you can't do that mm. um, in this space, in my opinion, because okay. For people that are looking for legal documents, like they're looking for real help. Yeah. I think people are willing to entertain like a crappy article about an apple pie recipe, but yeah. like, the guide to the IMM 5990. Dude, it which matters. Is the, yeah, it, it matters. But it's written, by, it's written by a lawyer, right? <laughs> it's written by a lawyer and, and we try to make it very pragmatic. So like, okay. here's what you need to know. Here's mm. how you fill out the form. Here's a video showing you how to fill out the form. Okay. Oh, and if you need to notarize it, here's the button to do it right now, huh. right? And that's the beauty of the Notary Pro platform to kind mm -hmm. of give a plug for what we do. Like we have what we call instant notary. So you, you need a notary, you Google notary uh, public, hopefully yeah. you land on our website and you see the button that says notarize it online now in minutes. And you can literally just upload your document, meet with someone on a video call uh -huh. and have it back in your inbox in about five minutes, maybe six minutes. Wow. To be able to take someone from a, like, let's say an article about a specific document to then getting it notarized, let's say in under 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. To me, that's a beautiful, that's a, there's a, there's a an beautiful accessibility thing. Man. There's a social justice thing. There's yeah. an equality thing. Like, yeah. you don't need to have a car to drive somewhere. You don't need to go up a set of stairs. You don't, need to, you don't need to take the day off work. Exactly. You, don't, you don't need to go outside of normal business hours or sorry, you don't have to go off whatever business you're doing to exactly. go be in person. You don't have to wait in lines. You literally can just access it probably even mobile. You can right. do it mobile. And that's something that we, we see all the time. And the notaries actually kind of joke is like, they'll say, had another one in their car, like clients doing it in their car. Yeah. Maybe they're on lunch. Maybe they, they could do it at work. They don't feel comfortable using yeah. government or, a, you know, computer, a computer. Uh -huh. You can do it on your phone. Mm -hmm. um, that's one piece though, to be honest, you talk about future sprints where the plan is to package it all into like a very hyper optimized mobile experience. I would wow. say it's mostly optimized right now, but putting it in like a mobile app, potentially that's also something that's on our horizon, but wow. there's a time effort uh, and what's the ROI, right? What, mm -hmm. what are we going to get from putting it into an app? Wow. Um, but I could see kind of future state a couple of years down the line, for sure, some sort of mobile app that mm. brings it all together, um, incorporates generative AI, which we could talk about. Um, and like, you know, does other things for people than just like digitally notarize a document. So yeah, now yeah. you guys done a hundred in a day yet? We have not, no. So we oh, haven't yeah. done hundred in a day. I yeah. asked, uh, my co-founder, I said, what's the closest we've come to that? And uh -huh. so it was actually in November, we did about like 87,000 in under two weeks. Oof. So it was nice. like, you know, pretty solid revenue. You're getting there. For, yeah. yeah. And the most important thing for us and like kind of without spilling too many of the beans That's okay. is the, the, what we call the ratio. So the digital to in-person ratio. So okay. we're really trying to drive more and more traffic to our digital revenue products or okay. services. Um, the margins are a lot higher. They're yeah. a lot um, more stable and, and, you know, basically help us continue to run the business. Huh. But we are committed to expanding and growing our network. And so we get applicants from notaries all over the U.S. all the time, which like not really a secret, but we're definitely looking at the U.S. market, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. that we're interested in. Yeah, It's a much more saturated market. It's a little bit more of a red ocean. There's a lot of competition. Yeah, um, But it's also a 10x in terms of the total market size, right? So. Yeah we we feel like it's inevitable that we try but mm -hmm. you know without again without saying too too much like we're going to do it when it's right and if it's right and yeah once the shirt gets too tight you want to worry gets about too it tight. yeah yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah. but we're interested because it's fundamentally the same overall notary services market same like, shit different toilet same language same time zones yeah like you know what i mean like it's it would make sense however there's lots of really good stories about failed attempts to enter the U.S. market. So we're very ah, mindful of that. That's cool. Um, How and we also want to continue to conquer Canada. So yeah, now that's not really something that you could um, like just learn in a book or learn online, right? And you were talking earlier about your <clears throat> experience with mentors and surrounding mm -hmm. yourself with good people that have done the things that you're trying to do that, that help you expand, et cetera. Um, how would you go about building a network that will help you um, expand into a new country? Yeah, well, I think first, first of all, we, we have an existing kind of pool of professionals we work with that okay. are, are you, you could argue mentoring us in, in sort of indirect ways. Yeah. Um, when we look at entering maybe the U.S. market, as an example, mm -hmm. I think at that time we would probably engage like a professional consultant. Oh, okay. um, and I think I've learned that at, at certain times in your business growth, like getting those professional consultants, maybe from one of the, the big firms mm -hmm. to just simply be like, hey, guys, like here's the playbook. You want to enter the U.S. market? Like here's the 10 things you do and 10 things you don't do. Yeah. 
I, I'm always cautious about kind of YouTubing your way through major decisions like that. Yeah, yeah. It's tempting. You might get a, lo a lofty apple pie blog. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, and now what yeah. I say is, or GPTing your way through yeah. everything, right? Like yeah. you could ask GPT right now, like how mm -hmm. should I expand my Canadian based service company into the US market? What are the top things I should worry about? Mm -hmm. And give me a standard operating procedure on everything I should, like it, it would write it. Yeah, right? but will it write it accurately? Well, will it be, will it be accurate and will yeah. it be like 10% hallucinations based on random blog articles it's pulling from. Apple, more apple pie right yeah Gosh, yeah these apple pies man they're getting well and like dangerous. the gpt might forget you got to peel the apples first right yeah, so you're like right. stuff like that that mm -hmm. i'm and by the way i mean i love gpt like it's it's phenomenal but yeah uh yeah i i would at that stage for sure you want to be bringing in legit professionals um we have legal advisors that we we leverage when we need to Mm -hmm. um and yeah otherwise we you know we're we're gonna stick to our guns with our, our current growth so yeah how are you guys like adopting ai you guys are all digital right so like how is how has that impacted you how are you guys harnessing it what are your what are your thoughts on it like yeah. just give me a little spiel yo lee we good on cameras Take a little sip is the rolling all right <clears throat> i'm good um you want to roll it? Just give it one pause for a second. That way they could see like the space in the editing file. Yeah, so we're definitely leaning into AI in a big way. Um, we've been experimenting with OpenAI for about six months now. We've been testing a whole bunch of cap uh, capabilities. So as a quick example, uh, in the fall, we launched the beta of what we call the Docs app. So this is kind of the big piece of where Notary Pro is going and where, I guess you could say where we already are, but where we're gonna continue to go. Like right now, anyone landing on our website, for the most part, they have their document or they think they have it. They upload it, they use it, they get it notarized and they go on their way. We get a lot of people who are like, hey, I need to notarize document X, but I don't have it. So for a long time, we've offered templates. You can just download them. Here you go, good luck. What we built is what we call the docs app. So think about like a simple intake form, you know, name, address, email. Now you can basically fill out your information and then real time using our docs app, you'll see your document being created on your screen. And then you have the chance to edit it and basically proofread it before sending it over to our instant notary platform where you can then sign it as a PDF. Free, free service, freemium service. That's a free service currently. You do pay currently. obviously for the notary service at the yeah, end, but yeah. the document creator is free, entirely yeah. free. Which and is that, cool because it, it just like separates you from the, you know, like the competitors, right? Exactly, yeah. And there, there's a couple other platforms out there. I, I won't name names, but there's other platforms where you can get templates. We'll crush them. No, you, can, you can fill them out and then they, they ask you to pay like seven ninety nine or whatever for the document. Mm. I, I don't have any issues with that. I mean, that's their business model. Mm -hmm. We just believe that for the average consumer who needs like a simple affidavit, which is just a sworn statement, usually like I, Robert Onley, I'm on a podcast right now. I swear this is true. Like, oh, that, you are. That's the type of thing. I swear I'll notarize it. Uh, th like that Sign type here. of document. Here. That's yeah. it. That type of document we believe should be free. Like, it's just so basic and elemental. Uh, and that's part of our overall mission is yeah. to simplify and humanize notary and legal services. Right. Wow. So we made that available. It is, I guess, you could call it freemium. It's free to use, and then you got to pay for the notary service. Yeah. Um, but we've built up a database of these simple legal documents. Cool. We let people fill them out, and then to Bring it back to AI real quick. We use AI on the back end to basically help us assemble and then tag the document. And that's kind of huh. more uh, an internal facing piece. Yeah. But it really simplifies what we're what we're building. That's your first job, remember? <laughs> that's it. That's, that's it. so funny. So dude, it doesn't make sense to me, man. You're 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 a dad of about to be five. Mm -hmm. Okay. You still are a lawyer and you have this. I don't know which one's the side hustle. If it's notary pro is the side hustle or you <laughs> being a lawyer is the side hustle. Yeah, yeah. And you don't look like you, you don't look tired at all. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm tired. Okay. Uh, you're, how are you not tired? And like, how are you managing your time <laughs> through all these ventures? Yeah. It's an awesome question. I mean, first and foremost, I, and I think I said this when we were joking around it to start, like I, I'm a big believer in getting a good sleep. Yeah. I know that sounds so basic, but like, I, I genuinely, like I shuddered right down at 10 o'clock. Like I do okay. not, I don't drift. I don't go up till midnight really ever. Um, and so like you go to bed at 10 o'clock or you stop everything. No, I go to bed. Like oh, wow. I go to bed. Sometimes even earlier than that. Um, wow. That's become like kind of more of a discipline thing. Okay. Because I just like the science is, it's there. It's settled, right? Mm -hmm. You need seven to eight hours a night. You just mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's 
become a fallacy to just do more and constantly do more and consume more. Um, and I also, I've really tried more recently to cut out even screen time after eight o'clock. And that's wow. tricky. Cause like, I got my iPhone, just like everybody, I got my Mac. Like you, it's so easy to just like post up on your bed and do a little work while you're watching a show or whatever. Yeah. Um, I've just tried to cut it right out. So you don't even watch a show after eight o'clock. Oh, uh, no, I definitely, I'll definitely watch a show with my wife. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the biggest piece is to not be engaging my brain. So I really try mm. not to really work after eight or nine. Cause I, what I find that happens is I can't fall asleep. Yeah. Right. You rev your brain up and then you're not sleeping and now you've ruined your next day. Mm. So you would have been better off just not working, getting a good sleep and then working the next day. Right. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. but that's, that's kind of the science of it. I think I'm also just a big believer in, in having a good work-life balance, right? Mm. Like I, I'm up early. I got four little kids I'm about to have our fifth. Yeah. Um, so I got to be up early, but like once I'm clocked on, like I work, I don't really mess around. I don't waste time. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I do my, we talk about workouts. I work out at least once a week, going to the gym, mm -hmm. um, do some cardio in between if I can, yeah. but just keeping that balance. And, so yeah. How's the day split? Like wh when is family time? When is lawyer time? When is notary pro time? Yeah. You know, well, well th I think first and foremost, notary pro is my full-time job. And you okay. mentioned the law practice. So I do have uh, some legal clients from time to time. Okay. It's predominantly kind of the evening and weekend thing. And I, I do have an associate lawyer who handles the work for me. So okay. it's uh, it's it's a really nice balance, mm -hmm. but that's one of those things. And, and I've had good conversations with my co-founders. The legal work is kind of like keeping my my teeth sharp or my claws sharp as okay. both a professional and as a notary. So it's serving your purpose. It's serving, yeah. And it helps, it helps kind of keep me in the game as a lawyer. Um, and a lot of what I do on the legal side is actually directly, it directly benefits the notary pro because I'm constantly working with clients in the tech space and the entrepreneurial space. And I'm kind of oh. seeing what they're doing from legal perspectives. And then I can apply those lessons into Notary Pro because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also general counsel for Notary Pro. So I'm the legal counsel for my own company, right? Wow. Um, so, but to answer your question, it, it's difficult, honestly. Like there's no, I, I'm not one of those guys that's gonna pretend like I'm, you know, you see those YouTubers, like I get up at 4 a.m. and I do this one hour yeah. workout and yeah, then a yeah. four hour cold plunge. and. Like I do the cold plunge though, by the way, mm -hmm. but uh, <laughs> I still haven't been able to figure, I haven't uh, got past my waist yet, man. I'm getting there though. It's the cold plunge. I'll just quickly say it's, it's such an exhilaration. Okay. There's probably science both ways on it, but more than anything for me, it resets your brain. So if you had, if you've had a tough oh. day, okay, do drop into water that's zero degrees. You do it at nighttime? Brain, I do. Yeah. You're sometimes different. I do it early, okay. uh, but I found out yesterday and no joke, I went to do a plunge and I forgot that it had been like minus 18. So the plunge was completely frozen. It was just basically a big tube of ice. So yeah, no, it did not happen. But, That's crazy. No, but yeah, honestly, at, at the end of the day, it's balance. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a man of faith. I pray, yeah. I, I go to church with my family and that's a big part of who I am. And like, mm -hmm. I, I just try to have a balanced lifestyle, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I also kind of grew out of uh, like just the drinking and the, the goofiness, right? Like yeah. you gotta be with four little kids, man, you gotta be able to bounce up at Saturday morning and take them to hockey and get them out the door. And, yeah. Um, so just kind of keeping it more, more simple in that sense. Huh. Um, but also just work, work hard when I do work. So from nine to five, um, I'm working hard. Yeah. That's, wow. that's it, man. And, and what's your thought on like this whole tech, like lifestyle, you know, like there's like this whole tech mantra, you know, or like the average tech founder yeah. that someone might describe, like, what is your image or what did you think a tech founder was like? And maybe was supposed to be like versus yeah. your life? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, it's a, it's a good question because we, we live in this era of, you know, Instagram, LinkedIn, where you've seen this constant like sort of hall of mirrors of like what everybody else is doing. And then oh. you, it makes you kind of reflect on who you are and how you're living. And I personally, I've detached from social media. I don't, I'm not on it. So just to kind of pull back to your question, like I'm not actually in that orbit. I don't, I'm not comparing myself to anybody else. I'm not mm -hmm. really looking at what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. I do enjoy LinkedIn to actually see what other companies are doing. Mm. Um, but I would say the biggest sort of change from what I thought being a tech founder would be to um, what it actually is, is that you, I think you think other tech companies know what they're doing and you think they know where they're going. And yeah. they, they put out these statements and vision documents and like, they're just taking an educated guess the same way I am with Nordry Pro right now, right? Yeah. Or if you're starting your business, like we're all just taking big, strong, educated guesses at mm -hmm. what to do next and where mm -hmm. the market's going. Um, so I think that's probably the biggest reality check is like, yeah. everyone's really figuring it out real time. You look at the chaos at, at uh, OpenAI, right? Over the last couple of months, like, did they see that coming? Dude, it's a ago? movie. It's, oh, a it's movie. totally a movie, right? <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. but also I think just the the reality that 
you can set goals, mm. but if you aren't disciplined, it means nothing. So I think mm. that's probably where I have, I would I'd be honest about this. I've struggled the most is like trying to chart a course for the company, setting goals on the board. And then three months later, making sure like, Hey, are you all still aiming at those goals? Like yeah, it's, yeah. it's easy to just put 10 things on a whiteboard, but then three months later, did anyone actually do anything? Yeah. Cause everyone gets distracted, right? Yeah. So. Do you have a system for accountability in your life? I just implemented one that um as of like a month and a half ago it's been really it's been a very interesting kind of relationship with accountability but i would love to hear your perspective i'm interested to hear that one i would say so for us as a company we implemented the sort of more traditional ogsm framework so objective goals strategies and measures okay, okay. um we kind of stripped it down to just the og okay uh, so objectives and goals and then everybody in the company has smart goals that are they have to be directly related to the overall corporate goals okay um that, and you let people set them themselves? They set them themselves in consultation with their direct managers and okay. then sort of under my, I guess, ultimate review as the yeah. CEO. Yeah. Um, but those goals have to be the, let's call them the smart goals for our full-time employees. They have to be directly related to the corporate goals that we set huh. at the executive and at the board level. So, okay. um, and this is all stuff that we've learned. Uh, I'm at, we're actually here inside the Spark Center and working with advisors here at Spark. So Ooh. it's maturing, right? And I, that's kind of to tie it back to the other question, like, I didn't really know what that looked like, let's say two, three years ago. And then yeah. over the last two years, it got a little more serious about setting goals and planning and sticking with them Interesting. Uh, as we grow. So Yeah, so um, something that I added recently. Um, so like I was having a hard time t turning it off, right? Like turning the work off because mm -hmm. it's like, you know, it's a treadmill of tasks that just never ends. Totally. And being able to put a stop, like a hard stop today and saying, you know what, like I've I've done already 40 things for the day. Like I don't need to do five more. Like it's not yeah. going to move the needle and like five more half acidly rather than just get it, go to bed, like turn it off and start again tomorrow has been something that's been tough. And like, at least it was now I've, it's much better. Like I turned off my laptop for the other, the other day for the first, I'm like, wow, this is cool. Like I closed down every single tab on Google. Like, wow, nice. That's nice. interesting. It's a good know? feeling. Very good feeling. Yeah. And so I, a long time ago, I used to work in a restaurant, a bunch of different restaurants. Yeah. And I was like, man, like I could leave the restaurant. Like, why can't I just like leave the restaurant? And every employee left the restaurant and then came back to their next shift. Right. And it's like, what happened? It's like, oh, we closed the kitchen. And I was like, oh, how do I close the kitchen in my business? And like, what do I need to know um, from all my team members? Because like, we're not a tech, I'm not a tech company, right? Like we're just, we just make videos for companies and stuff. Right. But there's things that we need to do, right? And I don't know about you, but I don't like asking people like, hey, what did you do today? Like, and I'm like, how do I find this information out? Yeah, yeah. So I made this uh, just like on my website, I put together like a little form that gives everybody automated emails. Okay? okay. And it's called closing the kitchen. So you go to my website, uh, close the kitchen. Everyone's got their own button. So at the end of the day and at the end of their shift, like they, they click the button and it's got some based on my goals, some based on their goals. And they just have to answer the questions. So for me, it's like, how many cold messages did you send today? How many people responded? And the the questions are set up in a way that when the data comes back and gets synced up with the Google Sheets, I could throw it in a pivot and understand like, what are my open rates? Like, mm. what are my, how, how accountable am I to my goals? And I could see the stats across. But some of the, some of the really fun parts about it um, was like one of the people on my team, they want to learn another language. So like we added like, hey, did you do your Duolingo today, for example? Uh -huh. um, but we... Uh, another one is like as a parent. So it's like, oh, how did you like, did you tell your kids you love them today? For example, nice, you know, and uh, for me, I'm just like, did I go to the gym? Right? <laughs> but it's like, a good goal, though. It is, you know, yeah, yeah. and and it sucks looking at it at nighttime and saying like, no, I didn't. And I'm like, okay. and now every everyone on my team is going to get the email Failed yesterday. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so but then my favorite one is like, um, what would you rate the day out of four stars? And why did you give it that rating? Hmm. You know, and what was the highlight of the day? So. Like there was, you go through so many things in the day, right? And by the end of it, you're like, well, what did I even do today? Yeah. You know? And so Always, I've, yeah. I've been doing a time study for like the last six months, like pretty much every 15 minutes, just writing down what I did. So it really helps because the first question is, what did you do today? So I put down a list and I'm like, oh my mm. God, I did so many things today. Like great job. You know, like I give myself a star. Yeah. And, and it feels really good, especially over the course of like three weeks when you're like, you know what? I'm just having a, like today's a wash. You know, right, like, right. and, and it just is no matter what I do, like today's going to be a Merp day and it just, it just sucks, but that's fine. Like if I have one, two of these a month, 
Like, I'm okay with that. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. like that's still, there's still 30 or it's 20. Still, it's a four star day though. Come on, man. This has been fun. This today, yeah. four, bro, four stars for sure. <laughs> what? If I could put five, it'd be five, you know? But yeah, there, there was a couple of days ago, I had a one star, but mm -hmm. it was like my first one star since like the middle of December. And I'm like, bro, it's not bad. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. And then like, I'm like, you know, what, what should I do today with my one star day? You know, like, I'm not going to try and work because it's not going to work. Let me just go back and read all my other four star days. And like, you mm -hmm. read it and I'm like, oh my God, like, I did so many things, right? And it just gives you a little, that's little, a cool system. Little boost. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost like that. That thing where you like you write down what you're grateful for, you put it in a jar, and at the end of the year you look at it. Right. And right. this is this is just a digital format. Like I can pull it up on my phone right now, nice. and not only for me, I can see it for all my team members. And like because I'll do video stuff for clients and try to hold them accountable to their goals too. Um, it's like, oh yeah, like did you what did, what did you say when you closed the kitchen? So right. and I don't have to ask them. It just it helps escalate the conversation so much more like you know when you check in with someone it's like oh what did you do today it's like i don't even have to ask them what they did today we could just pick up the conversation right on how was this i want to talk about this one that you did like tell me about that you know right. so it saves right. 20 minutes in the conversations with people and it it holds me accountable so that's like the system that i've added recently and honestly like my days have been better because of it you know nice. so it's it's nice. been really cool i can show you it after if you yeah you yeah i'm interested yeah it's so I'm, and i'm always looking at like so we use monday.com which is like a project management tool yep. um that's sort of newer to the organization and yeah. i would say we're still kind of growing into it yeah um but it's been a really good way of having our team be able to say like here's what i'm doing uh -huh. here's the status yeah like it's an immediate transparency thing you don't have to ask you yeah. just see the status yeah i would love to see how you guys are interacting with it because we have it but for some of our projects it doesn't give the detail and level of uh, transparency that I need. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. like seeing, cause like, let's say for instance, they have like one task, right. And it'll be like 10 different things for that to like subtask in that task. Yeah. It takes too long to upload them all to Monday. So we just don't even upload it, which might yeah. be like a capacity thing. It might be just us being lazy. I, I don't know. Yeah. Right. But we don't tend to go in as much depth easy enough in each task. Um, and what do we use? We use click up. Right? Oh yeah, I've heard of it too. Yeah, yeah. Same, same shit, different toilet, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but like, it's like we don't. So how do I get that level of depth? And the closing the kitchen has really helped. So it's it's nice. pretty cool, man. I I really enjoy it. And yeah. did you guys develop that yourself? The closing yeah, the kitchen thing. Yeah, cool. it, it's honestly it looks so ugly, but it's just a form on the site, and right. then automated emails synced with Google Sheets, and I'm like, oh yeah, I love this. You know, I'm nice. a friggin' Google Sheets nerd. You know. <laughs> well, that but that's like yeah. honestly the backbone of the modern business, right? Like we're yeah. in sheets and slides and docs like all day every day. Yeah. Right? So yeah, one hundred percent. But I was gonna say one thing, like we uh, and it's kind of more of a general comment. Like we use a lot of different SaaS tools, like different software pieces, and what we we kind of have a rule now, which is like. If nobody's used it in two months, cancel the subscription, huh. right? Because first of all, on your cash flow, it's a drain. Dude, software costs are run up like crazy. But it, it adds up. And when we're, we're now with 13, I mentioned 13 full-time employees, like I was staggered. We went, we did a little, uh, like an audit. Yeah. And we found like six or seven SaaS pieces that nobody was really using anymore. Mm -hmm. And we checked the terms and we could re-up at any time. So I said, cancel them all. Yeah. And the day someone needs it, sign up again. Yeah. Right? We'll yeah. pay for a month. And if they don't need it the next month, cancel it cancel again. It. Yeah. Like, and cool. now maybe that's a bad way to to do business, but for the most part, we're talking like big. Dude, you gotta be lean, right? They're keeps, expensive. Keeps man. your margins uh, cleaner, right? So yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. But yeah, that's just kind of an aside. But yeah. the Monday, Monday is a, is a good example. Dude, like, I told you at the beginning of this, we'll nerd out on some stuff. Oh yeah, <laughs> but like if you don't yeah. use these tools, you won't get the benefit of them. I mean, yeah. it's really obvious to say, but yeah. I would say as an entrepreneur, like don't be afraid. This is for like a someone listening. Like don't be afraid to try those tools, but mm. and don't be afraid to cancel them if it's not working for you. Just mm -hmm. move on to the next one, right? Yeah. What do, What do you think it's going to take to get to 100 in a day as as Notary Pro? Yeah. Big, biggest thing would be to expand our markets. I think we okay. there's a, I think a realistic ceiling on the Canadian market for notary services. Yeah. One thing we're, we're not operating in Quebec. It's a completely different regulatory environment. That's a different country, bro. It's basically, right? <laughs> uh, we would love to be there. Yeah. We've had some really good conversations with the the regulatory body there. Um, it's just a different ball game and yeah. it's going to require totally bilingual website, customer service, mm. everything, right? Because they have laws there about the language, uh, you know, rights and everything. So yeah. that'd be a big piece if we can enter Quebec mm -hmm. and then more meaningfully enter the BC market and then the US. I think we could get closer to that 100K uh, in a day, but yeah. that would take a serious lift on um, both like operational capacity and then system capacity. And yeah. that kind of goes back to my earlier comment about like, 
the infrastructure. You got to be ready for a 10x volume, right? Yeah. And a lot more people clicking and screwing around with your app and making it break, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. What's your relationship with investors? Yeah, so we we did one investment round uh, mm -hmm. in late 2022. So yeah. we have some uh, investors based out of the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, that was through, I guess you'd say, private equity, mm -hmm. um, really through networking. Yeah, uh, we've had an interesting kind of journey on trying to raise. So we did, uh, I would say, kind of do a soft uh, attempt last year uh, yeah. doing another raise. And Why though? Well, that's the thing. That's a good question. Why? Yeah. I mean, at the time, we thought to kind of keep up the momentum from okay. our first investment round. Okay. Um, the the challenge we face is we are a software backed technology platform or service platform. Sorry. Yeah. So a, a a technology backed service platform. Yeah. So what that means is we're not really like a pure all software, SaaS, like yeah. all software. Yeah. We have a lot of people involved. In the mix. Software enabled. Software enabled. Yeah. Uh -huh. So when we've gone, I've done a lot of pitches to basically all, the, almost all the big VCs in, in New York and LA and like, mm -hmm. they all kind of go, well, we're not really sure where we see the MRR, the AR, ARR, mm -hmm. the recurring revenue, yeah. um, but it's interesting what you're building, like keep in touch. And when you get to a certain stage, let's talk, right? Yeah, so yeah. I, I've never taken that as like a disqualification for us or like a invalidation of what yeah. we're doing. Like they think you're a cube, but they're just not ready to date right That's now. That's it. That's <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah. And I, my view is there, we've, we've started to capture a market in Canada. We're going to continue to grow. We mm -hmm. want to continue to scale. Yeah. If that eventually attracts institutional money, then mm -hmm. we'll go for it. We'll be interested mm -hmm. we'll talk, right? But cool. for right now, we're not running out of money. We're, we're continuing to grow. That's awesome. Uh, we grew at just under 40% last year, year Congrats. over year. So like, we're going to keep doing what we're doing and yeah. really just lean in and turn up the dials on where we're seeing growth, right? So wow. that's awesome. Yeah, but the experience of trying to, raise and doing pitches on zoom and you know putting on your smiley face for an hour and a half uh it's good experience right yeah. and I, I actually really enjoy it so huh. we'll see where it goes but yeah that's really cool so i know you're an seo nerd mm -hmm. okay and I'm, I'm my ears are perked up to seo so i'm curious like you have you mentioned you have video on your pages like what does that do to your seo ranking or yeah so do you think what do you think it does you know because none of us are google Right. right maybe we not, don't know for sure but again like you said we're all just taking educated guesses right so i think first like if you have a good uh depending on what the nature of your website is i think a yeah. good explainer video okay it will probably increase engagement okay. and increase the time spent on your landing page so if you have a good video top fold that uh, especially on mobile they can quickly quickly watch it mm -hmm. i think embedded youtube is really the most logical because most people have the youtube app so they can bounce into the app if they want so the experience is nice yeah it's a good way of getting your, you know, you can engage your customer, you can explain your service model. Yeah. Um, and then if you have like a really simple sort of call to action button right below that or right beside it, you're more likely to convert people. So mm -hmm. I, I view it as a chance to educate and to explain. Huh. Um, for us, we are a niche service that you need when you're told you need us. So for the most part, we didn't have to really explain what we we're going to do for you. Yeah. But when online notary launched, one of the first things we did was hire uh, like a like a Fiverr or an Upwork to put together an explainer video. Yeah, yeah. And real simple walkthrough, slowly, cool. um, what do you call it? Slow voiceover, easy to hear, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to convince people to give it a try, huh. and to to really talk up the the selling points. So interesting. I think on on key pages a video can do a lot more than what your text is trying to do cool because people are more likely to just watch a 30 second clip yeah yeah um beyond that i believe like so this is where i'm gonna go with like i think yeah that's uh, fine. i think the algorithm which is like capital a yeah, yeah. uh will uh, add sort of <laughs> credibility yeah <laughs> to your page if you have a good video that's got some good view count cool. and it will basically boost your page because it's it's lending sort of authenticity yeah. to the content because cool. google says well that youtube video has got lots of views mm -hmm. it's on this website mm -hmm. has lots of clicks mm -hmm. let's boost the the, the page cool right? so well you that's like my punch. ceo lawyer like season like mba on the street sort of yeah perspective, yeah but shout out scarborough yeah shout out scarborough so this is this mm -hmm. is really interesting because now you've just pretty much given me a new course uh to sign up for on yeah. youtube university so yeah. very i'm very happy about that so rob man it's been it's been an honor to learn more about your Thank story you. and it's been uh it's, it's a real pleasure to hear the depth the nuances some of the details and some of the key experiences that turned rob into the rob that he is today awesome. now before we go why don't you let camera one camera two whichever one you prefer 
uh, to let them know where they can find you, learn more about Notary Pro. I mean, if they just Google it, I'm yeah. sure it'll pop up, but let them know where they could follow you and uh, yeah, pretty much wrap up from there. Sweet. Yeah. So if you need notary services anywhere in Canada or really around the world, check us out at notarypro.ca. We're also on Facebook uh, as Notary Pro Canada. And if you have any questions, anytime, you can give us a shout. It's one 313 or just support at notarypro.ca. And we have a team of legal professionals that would be happy to help you out. So check us out, notarypro.ca. Rob, thank you so much. Beautiful. Thanks, and, man. And just like that, it's another episode of 100 Ways to Make 100K. Once again, I'm your host, Javon.ca. And on this episode, we had Robert Onley, the founder of Notary Pro, legal professionals all over the country, ready to notarize your documents in under seven minutes. Seven minutes. You heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Rob, thanks so much for having us. And uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode. Peace. Thank you.